Okay, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to uh, online um, virtual uh, thyroid journal club. Um, this is Mark Erkin, and um, I am really thrilled to be hosting this morning um, two really outstanding presenters. Uh, Dr. Imad Kandil is Professor of Surgery, uh, the Elias Hanna Endowed Chair in Surgery and Chief of General Endocrine and Oncological Surgery at the Division um, of the Surgery Division at Tulane University Medical School. Um, he is uh, also a senior executive member of Tulane Cancer Executive Council and the director of the Clinical Endocrine Surgery Fellowship at Tulane. Dr. Candiel uh, completed his um, training with a clinical fellowship in endocrine surgery at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He has written over 300 original articles, invited reviews and book chapters, and serves on numerous editorial boards. He has uh, a special interest in robotic endocrine surgery. Um, and uh, of note, he runs a very successful annual national course on thyroid and parathyroid surgery, uh, which is now in its 11th year. Um, uh, having attended that as a speaker, I can attest to um, the tremendous curriculum that he puts together um, and what an outstanding program it is. Um, Dr. Kendil's specific research interests have focused on clinical outcomes research related to endocrine surgery. Um, as is our, um, the format that we've developed, um, we do have an outstanding uh, discussant who uh, you probably really rely um, does not require any introduction. Uh, Dr. Louise Davies is Associate Professor of Surgery, Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth and of the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. Um, Louise is a senior faculty member of the VA Outcomes Group at the Veterans Affairs Medical Center in White River Junction, Vermont, um, where she also serves as Chief of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery. Uh, her clinical practice focuses on thyroid and parathyroid disease, as well as cancers of the head, neck, and laryngology. Um, she is extremely well known for her research expertise in methodologic research um, in cancer epidemiology, cancer screening, use of mixed methods research approaches, and particularly for research on patient outcomes, healthcare improvement, and clinical trial imp implementation. Um, I, I would venture to say that uh, she became um, a household name um, for the work that she did in defining the problem of overdiagnosis and thyroid cancer, and um, she is, certainly has focused recently on mitigating harm that can come from that overdiagnosis. So um, it's a pleasure uh, to have both of them presenting this morning, um, and certainly look forward to this morning's program. Before we start, um, I just want to remind everybody that uh, you can um, just simply click on the questions icon and we welcome your questions. I will do everything we can in order to be able to get to those before we finish with a hard stop at 9 a.m. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn over uh, the program to Dr. Candil. And once again, thank you very much uh, for joining us this morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Erkin, for having me. Uh, it's a great honor to be here today. Uh, um, I'm always honored to help with the programs with the Thank Foundation. It's, uh, it's been terrific work over the years, and uh, it's a great honor to be part of this program. So today I will share some of the data that we recently published in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons uh, on thyroid microcarcinoma, papillary thyroid microcarcinoma. Um, and uh, this presentation um, was uh, presented in the last meeting of the Southern Surgical uh, uh, Society and again was published in the Journal of American College of Surgeons. So I do have nothing to disclose. Uh, most of you received this slide as kind of like trying to figure out uh, what do you think uh, before and after my presentation. So this is uh, a young female, 53-year-old female. Now I consider this is young. Um, uh, but anyway, I'm hoping I'll continue to be young at this age. But she was found to have this incidental uh, thyroid nodule on carotid ultrasound. 
The nodule was round, solid, hyperechoic, and with ill-defined margins and uh, with some uh, features, uh, suggestive calcifications. You can see here the size of the nodule uh, is six millimeter in the largest diameter. So the biopsy was performed and it was uh, Bethesda 5, suspicious for malignancy. And the question is, how do you proceed? Would you do a partial thyroidectomy or total thyroidectomy? Or you would also consider doing a central lymph node dissection, or you would consider doing additional diagnostic uh, molecular evaluation, um, or would you consider doing active surveillance for this microcarcinoma? So uh, the goal of the presentation today is, so I guess we, yeah. So I wait for your the results of the poll and we'll take it from there. So I guess, Luis, if you can, okay. All right, very good. So, so Imad, um, I will just uh, chime in for just a moment. Uh, we've got quite a mixed um, response here. Virtually every category uh, is demonstrating um, folks who have, um, uh, um, who have registered an opinion here with the majority of people recommending a thyroid lobectomy. Um, a, a fairly good cohort recommending active surveillance, and um, probably the third um, would be to get further analysis of that nodule through molecular testing. So with that, we'll revisit this at the very end after our discussion here. Very good. Well, that's a, a very interesting uh, result, uh, data here to share. So I'm trying to close this. Okay, so... Um, the WHO in 1989 uh, defined the papillary uh, thyroid microcarcinoma to replace the, the definition of occult carcinoma, and which is defined as papillary thyroid carcinoma with less than one centimeter. The current prevalence of this is 30% uh, of most uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma and responsible only for 5% of related mortality. So the current ATA guidelines uh, recommend against the biopsy of these small subcentimeter nodules, and they propose active surveillance for selected patients with these microcarcinomas. So if you do the biopsy and you have microcarcinoma, the suggestion of active surveillance. And the, the idea is to attempt to avoid the risk of complications related to surgery or diminish quality of life following surgery and uh, associated healthcare costs related to these uh, surgical interventions. So I see patients coming to my office uh, with a biopsy uh, actually proving cancer and they are asking me to offer them active surveillance as a surgeon. They look me up and they just, well, we would like to proceed with active surveillance. The question is, when is it ethically and uh, appropriate to offer this? and uh, if they are good candidates. So I'm going to touch base on active surveillance. So everyone knows uh, Dr. Tuttle from Memorial Sloan Kettering, who is really uh, the leader in the field, uh, specifically on the active surveillance for papillary thyroid cancer. So he was a visiting professor at my institution uh, a year ago, and uh, he was proposing to do active surveillance for these uh, low-risk thyroid cancers. Um, so uh, this, if you notice here the date uh, of his grand rounds, I mean, he's basically telling my endocrinologist not to operate on papillary thyroid cancer. I mean, this is obviously not good news for me. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I do what I preach. So I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm going to go over the data and I'll show this with you. So I have to go after with another presentation to discuss why active surveillance is not really ready for prime time. So when you decide to do active surveillance for patients with uh, papillary um, uh, thyroid microcarcinomas, you look at the ultrasound and you want to make sure that these nodules do not have extra thyroid extension and there are no lymph node metastases. So let's go over the data, the current literature on this. So this is here a table that goes over uh, what's published on the accuracy of preoperative ultrasound for diagnosing extra thyroid extension. 
And the only study on the on the table from the United States is the last one. And as you can see here, the sensitivity is only 25% in diagnosing extrathyroid extension. Uh, the sensitivity ranged from 25 to 100%, but again, from the one study from the United States was 25%, and the specificity was also um, was all over the place from 13 to 93%. Uh, and uh, ultrasound recognized T4 lesions on Cascan as T3 most of the time. This is here uh, the data from Kuma Hospital, which has the largest experience in the world for active surveillance for uh, papyrethroid microcarcinoma. As, as you can see here, they showed that 16% uh, of uh, their cohort had uh, uh, progressive enlargement of their tumors over three millimeter after 10 year follow-up. So eventually these cancers will progress and we're going, to go, we're going to go over what does that really mean. So that's for extrathyroid extension. We showed this just the, day, the ultrasound is not a sensitive tool for this. How about lymph node metastasis? It depends on the series, but you can have up to 80% for central lymph node metastasis and maybe 40% for lateral lymph node metastasis with papyrethroid carcinoma. And the, the issue here with thyroid cancer is the cost. It's a big thing. So this is a paper that... Um, uh, was published by um, um, uh, Lipwitz, and it showed that the cost here is approximately $1.6 billion per year, and this is very comparable to the cost of treating solid tumors that really kills patients very quickly as cervical, gastric, or surgical cancer. So, um, and most of the issues related to cost is just for the surveillance of these cancers. Uh, so, we are dealing with really not just uh, a medical issue, but also with an economical problem. Um, how about the rule for the BRF mutations for active surveillance? As you can see here, this is a study from Meng Gao Zeng, uh, and they basically uh, think that, uh, that um, BRF can be used for this. But in the Kuma Hospital, they showed that the BRF um, Patients with BRF mutation did not have progression, um, and 10 PTC with has tumor progression without the PTC. So basically, the conclusion of the paper showed that the BRF alone was insufficient to accurately stratify the risk of progression on these patients. So this is the Kuma Hospital from the microcarcinoma data. And what's really interesting that if we look at the historical data that was published by Mazafari a long time ago, that after 30 years of follow-up, the recurrence rates were 30% and the cancer death rate was 8%. And uh, a delay from diagnosis to therapy of thyroid cancer for one year or more increased the likelihood of cancer mortality by 130%. This is um, uh, an established uh, published data by the Mazafari group. Um, in the past. But also, you know, there is significant global contest regarding active surveillance. And um, the problem is when we try to compare this to uh, active surveillance for prostate cancer, and we look at the data for prostate cancer, that once you tell patients that we are going to do active surveillance for your cancer, it's not a big deal, the compliance will decrease over time. So on the pr uh, prostate cancer data, the compliance decrease, the patients who are continuing to follow up decrease from 81% at one year follow up after diagnosis to 33% at 10 years after diagnosis. So you end up losing the follow up on these patients. Additionally, when you uh, tell a patient with cancer um, that you can follow up on them without any intervention, many of these uh, people eventually will just undergo surgery just because of the anxiety and uh, thinking of having cancer on them. So uh, I can go over this uh, over and over again, but now it's time to go over our paper. So the, the, the objective of our study was to provide an, uh, a perspective uh, epidemiologically from the United States data um, and look at the prevalence of uh, advanced pathological features in patients with papillothyroid microcarcinoma. We looked at lymph node metastasis, extrathyroidal extension, lymphovascular invasion, and distant metastasis at presentation. And then we wanted to see uh, what's the association between the high risk pathological feature that I just mentioned and the presence of distant metastasis. 
So in order to do this, we did a, we did a retrospective study using the uh, National Cancer Database. And this was from 2010 to 2014. So the data is usually lacking like approximately three years behind uh, um, before uh, being able to analyze it. And we looked at patients with pancreatic microcarcinoma who underwent thyroid surgery uh, and patients with a previous history of any cancers were excluded from the study. Um, these are the independent factors that were assessed for association with presentation with pancreatic microcarcinoma. We looked at age, gender, race, the extent of surgery, lobectomy versus total, and also if the patient had additional lymph node dissection, and we looked at radioiodine therapy and the hospital volume. So here is a table that showed the demographics uh, of the uh, cohort that were included in this study. So we had over 30,000 patients with papyrethroid microcarcinoma in the study. And um, you can see here over 5,000 of these patients had advanced features. When you compare patients with advanced features to the, the main study population, you can see that most of them were younger population, most of them were male, and to the patients who are white had a higher risk of advanced features compared to um, black and Hispanics. 82% uh, of patients with papyrethroid microcarcinoma had no other comorbidities, and the median follow-up on these patients was uh, 39 months, and the range was from 26 to 54 months. So looking at uh, the prevalence of these aggressive features and specific cohort of papyrethroid microcarcinoma, we found that 8% um, uh, will have central lymph node metastasis, and 4% of these patients with the tiny microcarcinomas will have lateral lymph node metastasis. So these, all these patients underwent surgery, and we now have data from the pathological uh, examination of the surgeries. Um, 4% had lymphovascular invasion, and uh, less than 1%, only 0.4% have documentation of distant metastasis. Extrathyroidal extension was present in um, almost 7% of this population. So in general, if you look at everything, almost 19%, one out of five patients with papillary microcarcinoma did have um, um, an aggressive feature um, from one of these features listed on the screen. Um, so again, looking at the study population, we uh, separated the study to patients without aggressive features and patients with aggressive features. So you can see here that uh, most patients with aggressive features did have more aggressive surgery, like total thyroidectomy compared to a thyroid lobectomy in the United States. Uh, the neck dissection part, uh, uh, more neck dissections were performed for patients with aggressive features, uh, and um, radioiodine also was performed in patients with aggressive features compared to less aggressive features. Interestingly, most of these patients with aggressive features were treated in hospitals with high volumes. So the hospital with high volumes offered mostly the, the, uh, the uh, more aggressive surgery and radioiodine. So uh, then we, okay, so what does that mean that you have these aggressive features? So we correlated this with overall survival. We have the overall survival data uh, from the National Cancer Database. And interestingly, we looked at the hazard ratio. So if a patient has central uh, lymph node metastasis, the hazard ratio was over 2 and so 3.6 for lateral lymph node metastasis. So clearly, lymph node metastasis affected the overall survival. Interestingly, it's the same thing with extrathyroid extension. Even microscopic was 1.8 uh, for the hazard ratio but with gross extrathyroid extension was 6.7. So the highest, interestingly, with the gross extrathyroidal extension. Lymphovascular invasion did not affect overall survival in, in, the, in this study. This metastasis uh, affected overall survival with a hazard ratio of 3.4. So again, you can see here that uh, uh, the prevalence in general was almost 19% with aggressive features, more in young patients, more in males, and more in white patients, 
and most of these patients were treated in high volume centers. So then we looked at the correlation or the intercorrelation between these aggressive features. And uh, we tried to correlate this to the worst one, thing, which is distant metastasis. So if you look at cervical lymph node metastasis, if a patient had cervical lymph node metastasis, they have an odd ratio of 3.1 to develop distant metastasis. How about if they have extrathyroid extension, this will, uh, will have an odd ratio of almost 6 to develop uh, cervical lymph node metastasis and uh, an odd ratio of 9.9 .9 to develop distant metastasis. Lymphovascular invasion affected also the risk of developing cervical metastasis with an odd ratio of 7.1 and lymphovascular invasion uh, can uh, the odd ratio is 6.4 to correlate with gross extra, extrathyroid extension. Even microscopic extrathyroid extension, if a patient has that, they, they can have an odd ratio of 6 to develop lymphovascular invasion and um, an odd ratio of 4.8 to develop cervical lymph node metastasis. So I'm trying to show here that these aggressive features are very correlated with each other, increase the risk of developing other features. So it's not, most of these patients will have more uh, than one feature and the odd ratio increase uh, uh, with having one of these aggressive features uh, that can lead to high risk of distant metastasis and affect the overall survival. So um, here is a capillary microbe looking at overall survival by, by the effect of thyroid surgery. What's really interesting that um, lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy did not make much difference, but what um, um, if, in general, in the whole cohort, but if the patient had advanced pathological features from the one that we kept mentioning, extrathyroid extension or lymph node metastasis, and you perform a total thyroidectomy in these patients, you actually improve their survival according to these Kaplan-Meier uh, analysis. So the, in general, there was no difference, but if you specifically look at the group of patients with aggressive features, aggressive surgery did help improve survival in this cohort with, uh, uh, with microcarcinomas and aggressive pathological features. The same thing with neck dissection. So if the patient had additional neck dissection, this uh, improved the overall survival uh, in patients with, uh, with uh, aggressive pathological features that uh, include extrathyroid extension uh, or lymph node metastasis or lymphovascular invasion. So in conclusion, patients with uh, papyrethroid microcarcinoma could harbor advanced pathological features that uh, are not easily detectable by routine preoperative workup. None of these features that I men mentioned earlier um, can be very well documented by ultrasounds or CAT scans. And all these features can be really only identified on histopathological examination that you can only have a following surgical resection. Um, we also concluded that the presence of gross extrathyroid extension, central or lateral lymph node metastasis, were associated with a higher risk of distant metastasis. Um, so we really believe that all patients with papyrethroid microcarcinoma should be counseled. The surgical intervention uh, would serve as not just a diagnostic option, but possibly as a therapeutic intervention, uh, as I showed from our results affecting the overall survival. Um, future um, additional studies are really warranted to identify specific risk factors that would favor surgical intervention over fact active surveillance. A um, significant part of my research is focusing on identifying molecular panels that can help with this. And I think these patients, if they don't want to undergo surgery, I think there is other current options like radiofrequency ablation. Um, doing something than just doing nothing. And I'm not sure that active surveillance is ready for prime time. And uh, it's uh, interesting that this data that we have here in the United States is maybe different from what was published by our colleagues from uh, different parts of the world. And with that, I thank you very much. Well, thanks, that's, uh, that's a hard act to follow, but uh, I'll do my best here. It's really a pleasure to have been invited to do this with you, Dr. Kendil and uh, Dr. Erkin. Um, let's see. 
I can. Having a little bit of trouble advancing my screen. Hold on if I can get, there I go, thank you. So I am your discussant of this um, really kind of fun, interesting paper. And I think the first important thing is to think about, well, why, why do we need to do this study? And um, this is a really important paper to have out there and to have in the literature, because at least for me, when I go to sleep at night and when I think about uh, the problems of identifying subclinical thyroid cancers is I'm always thinking like, is there a monster in the closet that I just haven't found yet, uh, that there are these bad actors uh, out there? And these are really important questions that uh, we need to ask about these small thyroid cancers. And so this and other papers like it fill this important concern. It's interesting, you know, this concern has been around a long time. If you go back actually all the way to the editorial that accompanied our paper when we first proposed that overdiagnosis or the detection of subclinical thyroid cancers might be occurring, Ernie Mazzaferi wrote an editorial um, really summing up, I think, the greatest fears of physicians when we think about this problem. And he worried that not all the small cancers are overdiagnosed or being detected at subclinical stage and perhaps not going to go on to become a problem. He thought some small cancers still are bad actors, and he cited several studies that showed surprising rates of metastatic spread, even for small cancers, although he acknowledged that nobody was dying of their cancer. So he seemed to accept that there was a little bit of cognitive dissonance there in that we're seeing cancer spread, but people don't die of it. But he emphasized how few people will forego surgery if they know that they have a cancer, and uh, especially if recurrence can be made to be essentially zero if you give a total thyroidectomy and radioactive iodine. And so he said these things, you know, this idea that there was a frenzy of excessive diagnosis and unnecessary surgery. And he outlined these things saying, okay, uh, you can have these things. I accept nobody is dying, but few patients will forgo surgery if they know they have a cancer. And I'm just going to move this out of my way. And um, he just really felt it's unlikely that patients are going to forgo treatment um, knowing they have a cancer in place. And I think these concerns are still present today. Um, why should we monitor cancer if we can take it out? So we have to say, like, is there a monster in the closet here? And these ideas, I think, stay with us because we have spent so much of medicine in the last century really trying to emphasize how important it is that we find cancers early. So this is a public health service announcement from 1938. Um, and this is still really, I think, entrenched in how we think about cancer. Catch it early is always better. We are seeing a change as we realize that um, there are cancers that we find on increasingly sensitive tests that have appeared, but then don't appear to continue to grow on to become a problem. And the latest of these, um, prostate cancer was one of the first that we recognized. Renal cell carcinoma is a disease that can exist subclinically. And now there are actually randomized trials going on about breast cancer and low-risk DCIS to compare active surveillance to um, surgery for that management. So these are, these are salient questions. And um, as Dr. Candil said, what happened to my... The aim of the paper here was really to look at what are the bad things that can be present in patients who have um, papillary thyroid microcarcinoma is focusing on nodal metastases, extrathyroidal extension, lymphovascular invasion, and distant metastases. And I think as we think about these data, um, I just want to help people understand what this data source is compared to SEER. So the National Cancer Database is a really excellent database 
it's a membership-based registry, so it, it has a lot of cases from across the United States, and it collects some extra details that SEER does not collect. SEER is the nation's um, population-based data source of cancer information. But um, the National Cancer Database is not population-based, and so the survival data that we derive from that aren't representative of the US necessarily. They're still helpful for other purposes, but they're not the kind of thing that I would quote to my patients. Um, and when we look at overall survival rates, and then we look at what treatment was done, it's important to understand that there are some confounding by indication issues with that, which we could talk about at the end if you want. I didn't do anything in my talk about, about that because I didn't think it was worth going into here. The, the National Cancer Database is really interesting. Um, the member hospitals have to be Commission on Cancer accredited, and many, many hospitals are members, but many are not. Um, Dartmouth, my institution is not. Uh, Northwell, Lenox Hill in New York City is not. Mass General Hospital and Massachusetts Eye Ear are not members. Neither is the University of Washington in Seattle. I just kind of looked through places where I knew hospitals and looked for names, and I was surprised to find um, so the National Cancer Database is a great registry. Um, it actually represents a lot of community care, so it's very helpful in that respect. So the follow-up time was actually short. Uh, we had 482 events. It wasn't stated in the paper, but I calculated it based on, our, uh, based on the data that was given. The follow-up's only um, three to four and a half years. Um, so maybe not quite as long as you would like, but doesn't undermine what we can gather from the, from the paper itself. It's still an extremely valuable paper. It's interesting to me that 22% of the hospitals were identifying 31 or more microcarcinomas a year. So you can think about that data in relation to your own hospital um, to understand a little bit about how sensitive your pathologists are and how sensitive your practice is compared to others in picking up um, small thyroid cancers. Just thinking about the data here and how it compares to what people are doing nationally, you know, people answered at the beginning of the talk that 27% um, of them would offer active surveillance and most of them would offer a lobectomy, but that's not actually what's happening nationally. <laughs> so if you look at the data, these are slightly different um, sets of information. So the National Cancer Database data across the bottom from Dr. Candil's paper, and these were one centimeter or less papillary cancers, 20% of the patients were getting a lobectomy and 80% were getting um, total thyroidectomy. That was 2010 to 14. So it was before the new ATA guidelines came out suggesting that you could back off perhaps. Um, the SEER data from 2016 for Cancer is less than two centimeters, so a little bit bigger, localized. 27% of people are getting partial thyroidectomies. 73% of people are still getting total thyroidectomies. So we're still, um, as a nation, we're still quite focused on taking out the whole thyroid gland for even the smallest disease. And um, I think we're all still really worried about these bad actors. So is there a monster in the closet? And I worried as I was thinking about this this morning, I was like, I hope nobody thinks this is insulting. I used to think that monsters in closets was like a joke and then we had the pandemic and now I feel like there's monsters around every corner. Um, so I, I would have to say, I actually found Dr. Candil's paper reassuring because I feel like what I interpreted from that paper is that the factors that are directly associated with lower survival are identifiable preoperatively. I know he listed a lot of that um, ultrasound sensitivity data, but um, I think, let's go through that a little bit. You can check for these things that are directly associated before you decide how to counsel the patient about management. So specifically, lateral lymph node metastases, and it's specifically recommended that you do lateral neck ultrasound to identify metastases. Some um, gross extrathyroidal extension can be identified um, on ultrasound. In fact, we're routinely asked to do that as clinicians now as we evaluate our patients. Central compartment lymph node metastases, definitely those are harder to see preoperatively. 
But it's really interesting, the relevance of central lymph node metastases found on prophylactic and central and lateral neck dissection is not clear at all. This, there was a really interesting paper that's quite old now by WADA that was published in 2003. And nodal recurrence rates were more common in people who were dissected therapeutically than prophylactically, as you might expect. But if you didn't dissect prophylactically, um, there was actually uh, no difference in recurrence rates. So whether you do a prophylactic neck dissection or not, did not seem to affect recurrence rates. And that's really reflected now in the ATA guidelines. So people are considered at very low risk if they have even five lymph node uh, metastases um, and if they have an intrathyroidal thyroid cancer. And all of these qualities down here, so multifocal, even minor extrathyroidal extension, the recurrence rate is low and well within what someone might want to consider in terms of range of surgeries that they're contemplating when you offer them their treatment. Just looking at this in a little bit larger format so it's a little bit easier to see, even the smallest, lowest risk cancers still can have a recurrence rate. And I think that actually just speaks to the behavior of papillary thyroid cancer overall. I always like to divide these things a little bit. So I feel like people in the two to 3% range are people who, even if they have some lymph nodes, don't have extra nodal extension and there's few involved. And then I sort of have another mental break point in the 5% range where you have less than five lymph nodes involved. And even if your cancer's a little bit on the larger side, so two to four centimeters. So let's go back. I think, you know, when we think about Dr. Mazzaferi's editorial and his concerns about small cancers, um, not just being indolent bystanders caught up in a frenzy, but really representing a potential problem. Um, I think it's important to understand that yes, those um, things can occur with small cancers, but we're actually able to, and we're being asked to identify those preoperatively. And this idea that no patient would ever want to monitor a cancer knowing that they have one, I think those things are changing, but they do require that physicians also believe that it's a reasonable option because it certainly would be, um, I've found in my work with patients and in uh, interview studies that I've done that it is very hard to overcome um, the physician if they're suggesting that you need to have surgery or need to have a total thyroidectomy, for instance. So what is actually happening in the United States right now? Well, these days, 90% um, of thyroid cancers that we detect are papillary thyroid cancers. And 43% of all cancers are um, two centimeter or less localized papillary thyroid cancers. So what we're talking about today is really the meat and potatoes of thyroid cancer care. And just to really understand um, and get at Dr. Mazaferi's concern about the potential for bad actors, I actually went into the SEER data to look at the mortality rate for cancers of this size localized to the thyroid gland. And the mortality rate is 1.4 per 10 million people. So the overall um, thyroid cancer mortality rate is 0 0.5 per 100,000 people. It's already very low compared to most other cancers, but the likelihood of dying of a thyroid cancer that's two centimeters or less and localized to the thyroid gland at the time um, that it's diagnosed is extremely low. That doesn't mean that you might not have a recurrence, but it means that you don't need to talk about death as a potential um, high risk outcome. And when we look at um, SEER data comparing any size papillary thyroid cancer confined to the thyroid, um, this is old data that um, is from back in 2010 when we were working on this concept. We found that people who were treated immediately 
the survival was 99%. This is cancer specific survival. And those who had treatment either not immediately or sometime later where SEER actually couldn't find evidence that you'd been treated, the survival rate was 97%. And this is cancer specific survival. And we have to balance this against the risk of major quality of life issues that can occur afterwards. So there's still a balance to be concerned with there, um, but death is not an imminent and high risk with this disease. The interesting thing too here is that um, we don't talk about this much, um, but we do know that lymph node metastases can be found um, in papillary thyroid cancer specimens at autopsy. There are two papers in specifically, and the range of occult lymph node metastases from papillary thyroid cancer was 16% in one and 18% in the other. And it's really interesting that that's actually 18% is the same um, rate that was found in Dr. Kendil's um, National Cancer Database study. So it makes you wonder, were those, were those lymph nodes, um, how long had they been there, for instance, and were they going to go on to become larger and start to impinge upon structures there? I think given that we're talking about um, the risks of um, thyroid cancer, it's important for us to actually revisit what do we mean by active surveillance and what does it entail? People use really interesting language around um, active surveillance. They call it um, doing nothing or um, not doing treatment. But in fact, actually, active surveillance might be better thought of as a treatment because you don't send people away into the ether. You actually have a very close follow-up and interactions and you're doing imaging studies. Now, if you show up at Kuma Hospital in Japan, you're only eligible if your cancer is about one centimeter or less. You have to have a clinically N0 neck um, at the time of diagnosis. They do um, baseline ultrasounds of the thyroid and lateral necks. They check a TSH, thyroglobulin, TPO antibodies, and calcium levels. At Sloan Kettering in the US, if you show up there, you can have a cancer size up to one and a half centimeters. They do a baseline ultrasound of your thyroid and lateral necks and a TSH. Again, you can't have evidence of central or lateral neck disease. The protocol for Kuma Hospital is to do two ultrasounds six months apart, and then they go to once a year. In Sloan, at Sloan Kettering in the US here, we do ultrasounds every six months for two years, and then we switch to annually. Tumors that show extrathyroidal extension or that have lateral neck or central neck lymph nodes at the time of diagnosis are not appropriate. So the ideal tumors for active surveillance are those that are solitary, that have well-defined margins, that have at least a couple millimeters um, of tissue around their cancer, no extrathyroidal extension, um, and clinically N0 and M0. It's okay if a tumor is up against the capsule although ones that are up against the posterior right capsule are less ideal because that is the sweep of the right recurrent laryngeal nerve. Those that are um, clearly uh, extending outside the thyroid gland are not appropriate, obviously. I think it's also helpful to think about um, what the likelihood is that someone's cancer will progress as they are on active surveillance. And we don't have a lot of data yet, um, and the data are observational. We need randomized trial data. But if you're in your 20s, you actually have a 76% chance that your tumor will not grow over the next five years, five and a half years. If you're in your 30s or 40s at the time of diagnosis, and you're in the Kuma Hospital cohort, your likelihood that your cancer will stay stable is 89%. If you're in your 50s, the likelihood that your cancer will stay stable falls almost 95%. And if you're in your 60s and 70s, that rate is even higher. And that's very good news. So people can really use that information. 
for people who are on active surveillance, every visit is a reevaluation of the appropriateness of surveillance. And uh, there's a clear evaluation of what's happening with the rate of tumor growth um, to decide about surgery. An increase of three millimeters in one dimension or a doubling in volume would indicate that surgery should be seriously considered. Certainly patients who have biopsy proven lymph nodes or who decide that they would like to no longer monitor should go on to have surgery. I think this, there's a real concern um, that living with a cancer is a burden, and I believe it is a burden. Um, we did research with the Kuma Hospital cohort um, to understand more about this, and we found that a third of patients reported that they worried sometimes or more about their cancer. When you compare this to work, uh, excellent work done by Dr. Anna Saka and her group, they found that treated low-risk thyroid cancer patients um, had approximately the same risk, uh, worry burdens. Their worries were different. They were somewhat or very concerned about long-term side effects and disease recurrence. So both populations um, have worry. You're trading one kind of worry for another. And when you treat with active surveillance, you're treating a cancer survivor in the same way that you're treating a cancer survivor after you do surgery, and both require excellent survivorship support, I think is maybe the most effective way to think about that. So we're done with this portion. We'll open up for questions. I'm gonna switch now to the uh, question again so people can revisit their thinking and think about how they might approach it themselves again. Okay, terrific. We are just waiting for our final poll. Um, and it actually looks uh, like we have swayed opinion, which is always very gratifying when it comes time uh, to assessing the impact of our um, discussions this morning. I wanna thank both of um, our presenters uh, for the work that they've done and for really two outstanding presentations. What I'd like to do is um, give uh, Dr. Uh, Candil, an opportunity just to respond uh, to Dr. Davies before I get to uh, some of the general questions that were posed from our audience. Well, Dr. Davies' presentation is just uh, really uh, very impressive. I mean, her work in the field uh, uh, is impactful, and her papers on this topic are just well known. Uh, I do have a special presentation about why this is not ready for prime time. I really believe that active surveillance has a role for most patients. Um, but I don't think currently that we do have the tools and we can go over the data in details. Like, I don't think ultrasound is sensitive enough to detect all these patients. Um, and I believe that molecular markers are, will be the answer for this. But uh, what was published shows that BRAF and TERT mutation is not the answer. Um, so I think it's gonna be something different. We're trying to find uh, like a microRNA panel that can tell us which cancer will progress and which will not. I think we are like literally two decades behind prostate cancer. I think in prostate cancer, they have more clear protocols using molecular markers and other imaging to really stratify patients or who is a high risk and who is a low risk. Um, I also think it's patient dependent. Some patients are very protective of their organs. The idea of surgery is, is tough on them. On some others, the idea of living with cancer can cause significant anxiety. So there is no right or wrong answer. I think it's uh, uh, a combination of different things. Uh, I agree that we have some tools, but I don't think we have all the tools. And I think uh, patient uh, role here is critical in making decisions. And we should not have, as physician, kind of like a parental rule here to tell patient what to do and what not to do, because I don't think we really have the 
clear answers yet. So if I could just interject before I um, get to audience questions. So in your extensive research, Louise, how do you, what do you envision to be the ideal scenario for how to, first of all, how to counsel patients and how to deal with um, the issues related to worry, both in patients who have undergone active surveillance or who um, are active, who are currently undergoing active surveillance, and for those patients who have undergone surgery. Um, do you have a protocol in place here? And I do think the question of prime time, this is a separate question. Um, do you, Louise, do you have concern about the ability um, of people in the community who don't necessarily have the expertise to identify those patients who are good candidates, as well as to identify those patients who are put in active surveillance to be able to be effectively monitored in a way that's going to allow us to, um, uh, to make sure that those, those small subset who do progress will be identified? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of counseling, um, I think patients should be given information about um, the benefits and risks of their surgery, the, the benefits and harms potentially, and for those who are potentially eligible, understand that active surveillance um, is available in some locations. I think, um, just to take on the prime time question, I agree. I don't think that all um, settings are ready to take on active surveillance. It does require that you or your radiologist feel comfortable um, with monitoring uh, cancer, which is probably not the case for everybody. Uh, and then it becomes a matter of, of comfort level with performing the surgery and the extent of surgery. Um, as much as we would like to believe that that we don't sway patients, we really do. And so I think it's our job as physicians to make sure that we understand the data so that we can um, we can convey it in an effective way to our patients so that they understand there are small but real risks with things like active surveillance, but there are also small but real risks with surgery and that they still may have a recurrence in these kinds of things. You asked about worry and um, it does seem to me that from the data that we have, we don't yet have longitudinal data about um, degrees of worry over time. We have cross-sectional data that suggests that after the first couple of years on active surveillance, people's level of concern goes down considerably. And actually that's partly why the Sloan Kettering um, uh, protocol is like it is because those first two years, people wanna see the results more often. I don't know if the cancer uh, level of concern goes down over time. I think it would be reasonable to assume so, but it would be nice if we had some data about that. Certainly survivorship support groups and close visits with physicians to review the data and review the test results to show that there isn't recurrence um, or there isn't cancer spread uh, or change in the case of active surveillance seems to be a very important tool. I don't know if I got all the questions, but yeah, there's a number did. of questions yeah. in the box, but. Okay. So one of the questions I have um, related to this is, if you were to project out uh, 10 years from now, do you envision that we will be expanding those people who are considered candidates for active surveillance? Um, obviously, Mike Tuttle has expanded this to 1.5 centimeters. Do you envision a time when we will be actually um, going even to even larger tumors and saying it's safe for us to put you into that mode of treatment? I think um, what I would really like to see is a randomized trial so that we could enroll people in controlled settings with tumors on that larger side. Um, you know, as you get bigger, the thyroid gland is just not that large. I don't know how much larger than one and a half centimeters we can go. Um, but if you have someone in their 80s um, who has a larger tumor and has competing health risks, 
you know, perhaps there's a role for observation there, right, where you can monitor it um, and look at their competing risks from their other illnesses. I think I think if we probably should be thinking about how large can we go to monitor. I'd love to see it happen in a trial setting. Great. So um, we happen to have a, another uh, Dr. Davies in the audience. Uh, Dr. Terry Davies is former president of the American Thyroid Association, and he has been actively uh, posting questions. We've unmuted his um, microphone here. So Dr. Davies, why don't you go ahead and pose the questions directly? Terry? Goodness, I'm not sure if um, that's working. Let me um, uh, let me address uh, the question specifically, and before I get to some of the other ones, before time is up, um, Dr. Uh, Terry Davies had uh, raised concern about exaggerating the importance of um, some of the very low risk tumors um, uh, based on percentage and the actual numbers, um, saying that the actual numbers are the best way to judge here. I'm not sure if I've got that correctly. And Terry, if you can hear me and you want to, and you can unmute, um, go ahead and interject. All right. Um, I am, um, Matt, I believe this was directed to you. Dr. Candil, are you able to hear me? Yeah, yeah. So I, I really don't think it's, uh, it's the size will be the issue as much as the molecular markers. Um, I really believe molecular markers are more important than just size. Um, I think in 10 years, we should have a better understanding of uh, the role of molecular markers uh, to help us with decision making. I do actually also believe that we be doing significantly less surgeries and not because we have molecular markers, but I think because we have other tools like radio frequency ablation. I'm a believer of the future rule of radio frequency ablation and thyroid cancer. I, we do it now and for benign nodules, but there are re multiple recent publications on the rule for, of this for um, thyroid cancer, uh, small cancers, and also for metastatic lymph nodes. And that's from Mayo Clinic data. I, I think we'll be doing a lot less surgeries, and I think we will have hopefully more data on the impact of uh, uh, molecular signature uh, rather than just size. I don't think we are there that yet. We are not there yet, uh, but uh, hopefully we will be there. But I believe we'll, we'll be offering significant less surgeries. So, Imad, I'm just. Uh, in, in addressing that, I appreciate your comments. I do um, I go back to the economic cost of um, impact of um, treating these patients. Certainly, if we were to um, uh, to try to get um, additional data on every single patient with a small um, uh, thyroid cancer, uh, that's certainly going to increase the cost. I suspect it may help us to. Uh, reduce the cost of um, of surgery uh, by doing so. But all of these interventions, one of our panelists or one of our attendees had raised the question about whether or not um, PET-CT could play a role here. All of these being issues that um, uh, will add to the cost of uh, trying to uh, risk stratify this particular um, uh, group of patients. Dr. Rossley from Australia has weighed in um, that uh, she did not feel that PET-CT would play a role in uh, clinical decision-making here. Um, so I, as we have done every week here, um, I wanna thank our um, presenters this morning and for, to all of our attendees. We have a hard stop at 9 a.m. And so um, with that, I wish everybody um, uh, to be uh, to stay healthy, to stay safe in these uh, crazy times that we're in. And once again, I uh, hope that you'll join us next Friday morning. Uh, we have an exciting presentation to offer. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.